Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Michigan Historic Preservation Network and our webinar ongoing webinar series. Today we are presenting Archaeology and Parkitecture, Cultural Resources Stewardship in our State Parks and Recreation Areas. You may ask questions in the Q&A box as you think of them. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. If you're having technical difficulties, please put those questions into the Q&A box as well. The Q&A box should be located in the bar at the bottom of your screen. If the bar disappears, wiggle your mouse and it will come back. The chat window will contain links to resources discussed as needed. <clears throat> there may be polls that pop up during the webinar. Please take a moment to participate. Thank you and enjoy the webinar. Please participate in the survey after the webinar concludes. Our mission is that the mission, the network advocates for Michigan's historic places to contribute to our sense of economic vitality, sense of place, and connection to the past. We could not do the work that we do without our members and volunteers. Please consider joining us at mhpn.org. The webinar series is sponsored by the Michigan Arts and Culture Council. Archaeology and Parkitecture, Cultural Resources, Stewardship in our State Parks and Recreation Areas. Today's presenters are Stacy Torjinski, archaeologist at the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, and Robert McKay, a historical architect with the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, Parks and Recreation Division Stewardship Unit. Take it away, Stacy. You're muted. Thank, Thank you. you. Allow me to share my screen. <laughs> How do we look? Very good. Go ahead. Very good. Well, welcome to Parkeology and Art and Parkitecture. Um, Rob and I have been toying with these words for quite a long time now, and uh, we're uh, happy to be able to give our first presentation uh, using this sort of branding for what we do for parks and recreation areas. Uh, we're very grateful to MHPN and very happy to be here. So I'm gonna kick us off just by telling you a little bit about uh, what we do, who we are and what we do for a living. So I am DNR's department-wide archeologist, and I'm also our park historian for Sanilac Patrick Lowe's Historic State Park. So I work with staff, our partners, um, and the public to steward archeology span on DNR managed lands, um, but also um, other state-owned lands as well. Uh, my, my partner, Rob McKay, is Michigan DNR's Parks and Recreation Division's historic architect, as Chris said, and he works with um, you know, a whole host of folks to identify and preserve historic properties in our parks and recreation areas and beyond. Uh, Rob and I work very closely together and we both, uh, uh, some of you who are watching today may know us, uh, we both uh, prior to DNR both served in the State Historic Preservation Office. So um, just a quick overview, uh, we're not assuming that everyone joining us today is, is a, a professional uh, or, or preservationist. So um, when we talk about cultural resources, uh, what, what's considered historic? So we, you know, for the most part, follow National Register of Historic Places uh, guidelines. These are resources that are typically 50 years in age or older. They contribute to our understanding of uh, local state <clears throat> and national history. They retain integrity of design, materials, character, site, and environs. They can be a district site, including archeological site, building structure or object. And um, cultural resources also include traditional cultural properties and traditional cultural landscapes, which may involve not only, uh, you know, cultural resources like buildings and archeological sites, but also overlap, may overlap into natural features in plant and animal, animal communities as they're um, relevant to the, to the community that uh, uh, is related. 
So those are the kinds of uh, things that we look for in our parks and recreation areas to take good care of. So um, I am going to focus on archaeology and how we, uh, you know, do archaeology stewardship in uh, parks and recreation areas. I love this photo. This photo came to me from uh, DNR historian Barry James. Uh, at the left, you see a trowel that was found archaeologically next to the archaeologist trowel today. And uh, I just, I love this photo. It uh, to be uh, represents uh, a lot of what we do. So uh, just a brief, a uh, move this window, just a brief overview to get us primed on archaeology. While some Great Lakes tribes historically migrated to what is now Michigan, others have been here since time immemorial. Most of human history in our state is indigenous history. And Europeans did not arrive until the early to mid 17th century, which is comparatively a very short time ago. Archaeology is the scientific study of the human past, using places and objects to understand changing people and environments. Preserving these unique and sometimes threatened resources on land and underwater is an important goal for all of us. Archaeologists divide the past into broad periods, and this helps us more easily think and talk about gradual, though major, cultural changes over thousands of years. The terms Paleo-Indian, Archaic, Woodland, Contact, etc., are archaeological time periods. They are not cultures. So this is just our archaeological device to get our heads around large blocks of history. So here's a, this table is a small peek into what archaeologists have learned about early Michigan. The, the first people in Michigan arrived, you know, more than 13,000, some think upwards of 15,000 years ago. And we often think of uh, Paleo-Indian hunters hunting big game, like Ice Age me megafauna, mastodons and mammoths and so forth. Um, the archaic period uh, included seasonal movement, use of atlatls, which I will uh, touch on in a bit here, uh, copper, uh, lots of fishing and shoreline sites, some of which are now submerged as lake levels have changed over thousands of years. The woodland period uh, with villages and horticulture, um, the use of pottery, the uh, transition from the atlatl to the bow and arrow and long distance trade networks. And then the contact period beginning in the 17th century with you know, French, British and American influences, uh, fur trade, missionaries and forts. And then what uh, we loosely refer to as the historic or American period after 1820 with European uh, settlement, treaties uh, and, and displacement of many indigenous groups uh, and the growth of industries and urbanization. So that is your quick uh, archeological timeline and that will help situate the rest of the material that I'm gonna show you. So when people think about archeology, span they most often think of artifacts and artifacts are just things that uh, people have made or used that were portable. Think about what you're wearing right now, your eyeglasses, your shoelaces, you know, the zippers on your clothing. All of these things are artifacts and archeologists of the future are gonna be uh, looking at our business as well. So um, artifacts are representative of, of the time in which they were created and used and can tell us um, so much about everyday life. These photos show a range of artifacts from state lands. Uh, in the upper left, we have a crude cart that was cobbled together with uh, you know, mismatched wheels, including one that uh, may be a railroad wheel. Uh, this is a cart with trees growing out of it that's located next to an old logging campsite in Sanilac Petroglyphs Historic State Park. Um, we have things like ship wheels that are curated at the Great Lakes Maritime uh, Heritage Center in Alpena. And I'll talk more about that facility and maritime resources in a bit. Uh, in the bottom right, we have a handful of artifacts, and um, these include buttons, including a military button, ceramic, and a smoking pipe stem, all from Fort Wilkins Historic State Park, way at the tip of the Keweenaw and Copper Harbor. Built in 1844, Fort Wilkins was intended to keep law and order during the Copper Rush, and the fort tells the story of life on the northern frontier during the mid-1800s, and artifacts um, are a very important part to uh, uh, of interpreting this, this, uh, this site and park. In the bottom left, 
we have a broken atlatl dart that's missing most of the shaft that would have been about four feet long. This is an early uh, Native American artifact. You can see the broken point and it's hafted onto a sugar maple shaft um, with plant fiber and sinew to tie it off. The atlatl or spear thrower was used in many parts of the world beginning 15 to, uh, 15 to 20,000 years ago until just a few hundred years ago. Um, actually, some people still uh, use atlatls today. Atlatls were a simple tool that could propel a dart like this up to 115 miles per hour. Um, so it was a very important part of hunting in everyday life back then. This particular artifact was found near Fayette Historic State Park and has been radiocarbon dated to around year 20. Um, that's interesting to think about, year 20, right? So we have artifacts that represent um, all time periods and all peoples in Michigan, Michigan's past. Archaeology also includes non-portable materials called features, you know, things that stay put. In these photos, you'll see uh, in the upper left, this is an 1864 surveyor's benchmark on the rocky shore of Lake Superior at Fort Wilkins Historic State Park. Orlando Belinda Wheeler was part of the U.S. Lake Survey, and you can see part of his initials in the carved benchmark. In the upper right, this is a footprint where a building once stood in the historic town site of Fayette. The town was an industrial community that manufactured charcoal pig iron between 1867 and 1891, and many impressive uh, structures still stand, uh, including the iconic blast furnaces that you'll see in a bit here. In the lower photo, also from uh, Fayette, you'll see the remains of industrial dock pilings that represent what used to be the, the, the very busy uh, smoky, loud, industrial waterfront of the, of, the, of the town site when it was an industrial use. So we work with artifacts, things that are portable, and features that stay in place. We also work with submerged resources and shipwrecks. The shorelines of our parks and recreation areas may be sensitive for the presence of maritime resources. Lifted by wave action or ice, ship wreckage and artifacts may move up and down and onto and off from our shorelines. The movement of maritime resources can be dynamic, unlike most terrestrial land archeological sites that generally stay in one place. The tracking of these materials can be important. So our maritime archeologists created a beach wreckage reporting form that's available at the length at the top of the slide. So through this, the public can report observations that help us track and protect uh, these resources that represent Michigan's maritime history. At the left are photos of DNR state maritime archeologist, Wayne Lusardi. Wayne works out of the Great Lakes Meritage Heritage Center at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Alpena on Lake Huron. And this is an incredible facility. Uh, and the sanctuary is co-managed by NOAA in the DNR's Michigan History Center. Wayne does a lot of field work um, in our state parks and recreation areas and also curates an extensive maritime artifact collection um, from this facility in Alpena. And if maritime resources is your GM, this facility is, is a must see. The center and upper right photos are of wreckage near Heft, or near Heft State Park on Lake Huron. And the bottom right photo is wreckage in the Rockport State Recreation Area, also on Lake Huron. With people living in Michigan for millennia, or since time immemorial, there are sometimes resting places in state parks and recreation areas that we're responsible for too. So we protect cemeteries and burial sites. We sometimes have the unanticipated discovery of remains found during construction or as the result of erosion. And as appropriate, we work with descendant communities, um, such as Native American tribes, to care for the resting places of ancestors. And like uh, all museums, we, of course, must comply with NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. If you are unfamiliar, I strongly encourage you visit the National Park Service's National NAGPRA website. I put the link here um, uh, so that you can learn more. 
We frequently work in our historic state parks, often doing archaeology ahead of construction projects. We also frequently work with our museum system inside and outside of state parks and rec areas to display artifacts and create interpretive exhibits. This work requires uh, a close relationship with Michigan History Center leaders, Director, San Director Sandra Clark, Director of Museums, uh, Toby Voigt, and the historians for the various um, historic state parks and museum sites. So each state park and museum has a historian dedicated to it, and they're responsible for telling the, the important stories of those properties. So we all work very closely together. Many of you are familiar uh, with, with these places. Um, we have the Michigan History Center, our sort of flagship uh, center in, in downtown Lansing, and this is where I work. Um, we have exhibits on state history, and also this is where we curate the state, arch the state archaeological collections um, in close cooperation with the State Historic Preservation Office archaeologists. So uh, History Museum uh, in the History Center in Lansing is their home base. But from there, we have so many wonderful sites, Cambridge Junction Historic State Park in, in, uh, near Brooklyn, Michigan. This includes Historic Walker Tavern, which has played a very important part in the growth of historic archaeology nationwide. Um, early ceramics studies um, of how ceramic materials relate to class structure um, uh, were done using materials from this park. And so this has a really unique place in the history of American archaeology. And the, we work closely with historian Lori Perkins at this park. Uh, we have Father Marquette National Memorial. If, if you're heading north on 75 and cross the bridge, it's on the left. This is part of Straight State Park. Um, we have the Fayette Historic Town Site. This is on the gorgeous Garden Peninsula in Delta County. Um, we work closely with historian uh, uh, Troy Henderson, uh, and so much archaeology and historic preservation has been done at this site. And this was also a really important site um, in the late 90s for historic preservation field schools, um, and, uh, cooperating between the DNR, the State Historic Preservation Office, and Eastern Michigan University Preservation Program. We have Fort Wilkins and Copper Harbor Lighthouse. And again, this is at the very tip of the key went on. We have the Julia and Ulysses S. Grant home in Detroit, the Hartwick Pines Logging Museum, and the Higgins Lake Nursery and CCC Museum in the Upper Lower Peninsula. And we work with historian Hillary Pine, uh, the Mann House in Concord, Michigan, um, also uh, uh, led by historian um, Lori Perkins the Maritime Heritage Center in Alpena that we um, co collaborate with NOAA on and where, where Wayne works. Uh, and then the uh, Michigan Iron Industry Museum. This is in Agani. And if you're interested in the history of mining and in our Upper Peninsula, such a unique and rich history, this museum has exceptional exhibits um, with, with um, you know, uh, uh, loads of artifacts that have been found on archeological sites. Um, archaeological industrial sites in the UP. So check it out. We have the Sanilac Petroglyphs Historic State Park that I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, and Talis Point Lighthouse. So um, many of you are familiar with these places. And uh, if you have a favorite, drop them in the chat, drop the names in the chat. We'd like to, uh, to know which ones are your favorite. Um, so we work with all the historians as well as the park supervisors, the DNRs, uh, Parks and Recreation Division stewardship unit to make sure that we're all doing our part to make sure construction uh, projects, maintenance, interpretive projects all go well. I serve as the state's historian for Sanilac Petroglyphs Historic State Park near Cass City, and this is in the thumb. It's not really on the way to much, so you really got to want to go there. So uh, check out the DNR's website on the park and, uh, and uh, look closely to where it is so that you can go visit yourself. This is our first state park co-managed with a tribe, the Saginaw Chippewa Indian Tribe of Michigan. And we work closely with the Zeebwing Center of Anishinaabe Culture and Lifeways in Mount Pleasant, mainly Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Mar Marcella Haddon and Curator William Johnson. 
This site uh, includes the largest collections of um, Native American teachings carved in stone known in Michigan. These carvings or petroglyphs represent the collective memory of the Great Lakes Anishinaabek original people. Um, ceremonies and teachings were conducted uh, through historically at this sacred site and many ceremonies still take place at the Sanilac petroglyphs today. These fragile carvings in sandstone are easily affected by natural and cultural forces. If you gently touch them, you can feel the grit of the sandstone um, you know, wear off on your hand. Many of the carvings have faded naturally throughout the centuries, but some have been vandalized or, or even chipped away and stolen prior to the 1930s. With the help of our Michigan Department of Transportation, Tribal and state partners are working more closely than ever to care for and document this site and use digital preservation, employing terrestrial LIDAR and close range photogrammetry um, to keep track of the site. Um, in the lower left, you can see a carving that sort of has a cage model over it. And then below there is sort of the greenish model. These are just some of the digital models that we can create, which are 3D models so we can track uh, preservation and change in the, the carvings over time, but we can also create a comprehensive, easier to uh, view uh, documentation of all the carvings that are present so that in the future they may be used for tribal-led distance learning. And here's a photo of uh, uh, some of our collaborators, some of us at the DNR, our friends with the Z-Wing Center, and the MDOT Survey Support Unit that does this incredible digital documentation for us. In the upper right, you'll see a picture that looks uh, often referred to uh, as the Archer or Bowman. But this is a Modakwit, and it represents Anishinaabek ancestors shooting an arrow of knowledge into the future so that later generations connect to and learn from this sacred place. Through respectful collaboration and modern technology, we are dedicated to preserving this site for the next seven generations. And we call the site Sanilac Petroglyphs, but in Anishinaabe Moen, it is called Ejibigatik Asin, which means knowledge written in stone. So if you haven't been to this truly unique park, um, check it out. So we do, uh, I and Wayne and others do statewide field work and we help with an interpretive uh, exhibits and programs. So we travel all around the state. In the upper left is a photo of uh, me working with uh, archeologist Jessica Yan. This was a few years back and we were digging, uh, we, we even pay attention to the small things. So a historian at one of the parks wanted to just put in a simple park sign on a single post, a four by four post. And we knew this area was sensitive. So we, we dug a small excavation unit ahead of installing that sign. And we're very glad we did because we found early um, indigenous pottery, uh, an almost complete fish skeleton um, uh, that uh, you know, demonstrates how this land was used hundreds of years ago. But even the simple act of putting a four by four post in the ground we have to be thoughtful about. So uh, part of what we wanna do today is help you gain an understanding and hopefully an appreciation for how thoughtful the DNR is and how hard we work um, to do the very best we can to protect resources. In the upper right, this is some testing that was done ahead of work at Fort Wilkins. Uh, you can see the, the, the fence from the fort as well as in the background, um, the reconstructed cabins, um, married enlisted men's cabins, and those were reconstructed um, using archeological information. Uh, in the middle and the bottom is uh, historian Barry James who works out of Iron Mystery Museum in Nagani, um, as well as uh, Fort Wilkins. This photo was taken at Fayette uh, when we did a, a public archeology span program and uh, Barry, before we started the excavations, Barry said, I wanna find a coin. I wanna find a coin that dates to, you know, when the town site was in use. And towards the end of our excavations, we had some kids working with us and um, the young man in the middle um, reached in and pulled out of a screen, a coin that dated from just the year after the town site was closed down. And uh, Barry was quite jealous, but uh, we do a lot of work with the public and a lot of work with both adults and kids. And so it's important um, that we get people physically involved 
um, so that uh, because there's really nothing like uh, you know finding and touching things yourself. In the bottom right, uh, we also do projects with Michigan Cares for Tourism, which is a, uh, a partnership between Grand Valley State University, the DNR, and others to do good big works projects. Uh, on, on, on DNR lands. Usually it's assistance with uh, preserving historic buildings. And so um, a big group will descend upon one of our parks and do everything from painting bathrooms to working on um, window preservation, foundation you repair, repair, you name it. And the photo in the bottom right is uh, archeology span that was done as part of a Michigan Cares for Tourism project at Cambridge Junction State Park. And then on the left, this is just a, a sweet little picture of um, uh, how we use archaeology to teach people in our museum system. This is a photo from the Michigan History Center, where um, if you look at the photo above that little piece of pottery, um, we uh, teach about uh, um, early indigenous pottery at the museum. And so there's some hands-on interactives that we do based on archaeology. So in the lower left, these kids are working on taking those little pieces that archaeologists find and putting them back together um, to see the whole uh, pottery vessel. And uh, we do field work throughout the year. And in fact, just this Tuesday, we spent a very, very cold day at Father Marquette National Memorial and Strait State Park surveying an area prior to a proposed construction project. And this was a really cool project because we didn't find anything. Um, if you plan well, and especially if you wanna build something, not finding anything is the best thing that can happen for archeology. span uh, We don't always wanna find things. If we don't find anything, that means nothing's going to be harmed in the building of, of a given structure. So this was, uh, we count this as a success. And because of the significance of the straits um, and this landscape, to Great Lakes and Anishinaabeg, we were joined in the field by uh, not only DNR historian Hilary Pine, but also Sault Ste. Marie tribe of, of, of Chippewa Indians preservationist and archaeologist Marie Richards and her assistant Gijig McCoy. So uh, great field work uh, that we snuck in on Tuesday right before the snow started hitting. Uh, uh, and, and here we are all sitting in the snow. Like my mom would say, it's a blustery day in, in Pooh Corner, right? We're getting buried here where I live in Ionia. But um, how can you help? So how can you uh, help efforts for archeology span in state parks and recreation areas? Well, we want you to know that once an artifact is removed from its original location, it loses its research value unless it is properly documented. So if you find something that's a historic artifact or you think might be old, leave it in place and record the find with photos. Um, you can usually take a little, you know, use the GPS on your phone and report it to DNR archaeologists. If there's a park you love to go to and you happen to know that there's artifact scatters on the landscape, you know, um, as you go visit, maybe you like to walk your dog there or you visit seasonally, it's always helpful to have visitors check on things and help us uh, help be our eyes in the field um, to protect things from looting and vandalism. And any damage uh, you can report to us as well. It's also important to protect archaeological sites from disturbance. A lot of them are at surface or very close to surface. So things like unauthorized ORV traffic can tear up archaeological sites. So if you're an ORV user, stay on the designated routes. That really helps us protect important sites. And then you can also use the beach, res beach wreckage reporting form and submit shipwreck information to Wayne. And that helps us track those. Um, overall, artifacts from state-owned lands and bottomlands are protected and cannot be taken uh, without uh, certain approvals and permits. You can also help us by metal detecting responsibly on state-owned lands. On the DNR website, you can find um, all the parks and uh, what you can and can't do for metal detecting. We have lists of uh, parks that are open to metal detecting in all areas parks that are closed to metal detecting, uh, including all of our historic state parks are entirely closed to metal detecting because the history belongs to the whole state of Michigan and shouldn't walk away with just one person, right? So we protect those. And then there are other parks and recreation areas that just have designated areas where it's appropriate. So check out that website to learn more about metal detecting in state park and rec areas. We do have some challenges, of course, and this could be a whole nother webinar 
where in the upper left, you see a DNR conservation officer who's recovering shipwreck bits that uh, were looted from shorelines. And the bottom left, you'll see a photo where, um, you know, people uh, have been, you know, disrespecting and picking at um, an early uh, indigenous site in one of our state parks. And then on the right, um, we have a, an ongoing list of construction projects. You know, all of these facilities need care and feeding and maintenance. So uh, just this year, Fort Wilkins Historic State Park is getting the water line system. So we did archeological monitoring to make sure that that trenching work didn't hit anything important. So there's always so much to do. Um, we do a lot of archeology span and service of architectural preservation. Um, the column on the left shows the machine shop at Fayette. Uh, they were replacing the flooring and it revealed the brick base for a steam engine that will be interpreted in a new exhibit uh, coming into this building. In the center column, you can see the iconic blast furnaces at Fayette. And we did archaeology prior to masonry repair to make sure no artifacts or features were disturbed. And the column of the right, and incidentally, this is my personal favorite building in our state park system. This is the 1848 Keepers Dwelling at Copper Harbor Lighthouse in Fort Wilkins State Park. So with that, this is a good segue over to my brother, uh, Rob McKay, who's gonna take it away with architecture. I am going to stop sharing my screen and let Rob take it over. All right. Theoretically, you can see the architectural overlord hanging over the model of um, the memorial building. Is, is everybody seeing that? Are we, are we good? Can you hear me now? All right. Yeah, you're good. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, so for those that you, of you that I don't already know, uh, my name is Rob McKay. I am the first historical architect for the Department of Natural Resources. Um, like Stacy, I'm a transfer from the SHPO. I've been working with uh, state park properties um, since for 24 years, uh, since I started the with the historical center. Um, and I have, over time, had the opportunity to work on all of the state historic parks and many of the other state parks that include historic above ground resources. Um, and it's taken a while, but uh, ultimately I, we were able to uh, get the park system to understand and really appreciate that having somebody that can work directly with the historic resources on staff on a full-time basis uh, would be beneficial. So I had the opportunity to start with uh, Parks and Rec in uh, February. Now, I haven't quite been there a year, and I have also already started working um, a little bit more like Stacy does uh, with the larger DNR property portfolio. So I've actually had some interactions with um, uh, forestry division uh, properties uh, and uh, the wildlife division properties. So um, Stacy, she gave you that great list. She has a lot of time period to work with. I only have to deal with stuff above grade from like 1820 on. So, but um, early, early in my profession, I discovered that I didn't know anything about archaeology and that I was going to have to figure something out about it because every time I started to do something on a historic building, it almost invariably involved um, some form of excavation. So, um, my sensitivity and my understanding for the direct connection um, to above and below ground resources has really grown over the years. Um, but uh, I focus primarily on our state park system. Um, there are 103 state parks. Uh, we currently have a department recognized list of uh, 403 historic resources. Um, they do include something in every category of resource. So uh, we do have properties that are historic districts. Um, and in those districts, we have everything from industrial buildings to educational buildings to uh, residential buildings. Uh, this is the historic district complex on um, Lime Island. Uh, it was a fueling stop, uh, an up and down river fueling stop associated with uh, the Sioux. 
And um, you can even see that in this, this image of the site, there's an underwater resource. There was a, a ship that was actually sunk inside this inner harbor as part of a, a docking system. Um, so we, we have, you know, the traditional district sorts of resources. Um, we have unique buildings um, and some of them may or may not be national register eligible, but um, for example, the, the manager's residence, uh, many of you know, in uh, the Grand Home Administration, there was a push for the state parks to stop being in the landlord business. Um, and we had all these, some of them are very wonderful period manager's residence um, that were going vacant. And so we, when we inventoried the parks, we included uh, residents and we tried to find some different ways to use them. So many of these today are um, what we call modern lodges. Um, uh, but then we have, obviously we have kind of a little bit of everything. We have some, uh, lots of what I will call traditional rustic architecture. Um, many of them, uh, like the Ralston cabin here, came to the park pre parks pre-built. This was a private hunting lodge uh, that's associated with the Holly Rec area. And eventually the, that property was uh, gifted to the state and it brought the cabin with us. Uh, then we have some really wonderful uh, architectural examples of, of period design. Um, not everybody loves the Grand Haven Beach House and Concession Pavilion, um, but I really do think it's a wonderful thing. Um, along our trails, we have a variety of railroad-related resources. They may be uh, depots, they may be marker signs, they could be cold tipples. Um, so we have quite a, an inventory of those uh, as well, uh, which we are really only beginning to get uh, a handle on. Um, we have lots of schools, lots of one-room schools, or rural schools. Um, and then we keep discovering that we have things that we kind of didn't recognize. Um, this is the actual auto elevator that is on the grounds of the state uh, ferry terminal in uh, Mackinac City. Uh, I became aware of the elevator and, and actually this whole complex um, because I had a question about wanting to do some work on a comfort building that was associated with this. So, you know, we think we have a pretty good inventory and then we keep discovering that we have uh, more resources that we need to look at. So um, this gives you a good, a, a good feeling for some of the breadth of, of what we cover. Um, we also have lots of, of objects, structures and objects. Again, um, you know, they may be fairly obvious WPA related, you know, masonry and stonework and those sorts of things. Um, but then we get bridges, again, uh, railroad related things. Um, and everybody's favorite, the Halsey Taylor Fountain. Um, you know, they were ubiquitous at one point. They defined what a water fountain, not only in a state park, but in a national park and in many county and local parks. Um, yeah, you know, time changes and they become difficult to maintain and operate. And as, as our collection of them dwindles, we have to figure out what to do with those uh, and, and how to best tell that story. So what we have right now, uh, it, it, it's a really creative name. You can see it there. Um, the difficulty is that people in the department talk about the HSR. It's not really a historic structures report. It's a historic structures and related resources report, so HSRR. Um, but there you can see, uh, so we've got 44 parks that have historic resources in them, uh, four linear trails or linear parks, what we call linear parks. Uh, and then the three additional properties are um, a boat launch, a harbor, and a uh, part of South Fox Island, where we have cultural resources that we are also responsible for. So um, 202 are listed. Uh, I didn't realize quite there were that, there were that many listed, um, but it's good to know. Uh, and then 66 are were determined to be historically significant by DNR staff and SHPO staff back in 2021. 
Uh, and we operate under the assumption that they need to be maintained and preserved. So here's a list of, of the parks if you want to you know, see it, you, you see if your favorite park is on there. Um, the rec areas, uh, trails, and then the other locations where we have some historic resources. Uh, but for me, uh, I think the, the most telling and, and probably the most reliable way to present it is uh, this is our district map. So it tells you how each park is managed and, and who does the planning. Um, the important part about it is there isn't a district, there isn't a unit in the state where we don't have historic resources that we need to identify and manage appropriately. So um, that has that is my primary responsibility. Uh, my primary responsibility is to work with, with managers and planners and district managers um, to take into account our decision-making process and the impact that it may have on our historic resources. Um, I, this may seem simplistic to a lot of people, um, but you have to understand that a lot of times the people who are making some of these key decisions are in fact our rangers. Um, in the Michigan park system, Rangers are expected to be the eyes and the ears of the system and the people who can pretty much do anything, okay? Uh, so they're expected to mow and clean restrooms and do carpentry and do welding and maintain equipment and maintain buildings. So in, in an attempt to try to standardize some of the language because you know language makes a difference it's one of the things that I've, I have said for a lot of years we're trying to develop a, a park nomenclature that talks about things in a consistent fashion so preservation um, you know stealing that directly from the, the park service routine maintenance it's another thing that lots of people talk about uh, replacement in kind um, but then to try to get the point across, I'm, I'm trying to, I have been trying to identify the sub messages, you know, so what's the key concept in this? And um, we just did a, a this year's training academy and, you know, getting people to understand that at one level, if you're not changing anything, yeah, you're good. We can probably go about it. Um, when there's change that's involved, um, that's when we need to move things up the food chain. Um, or when you put a shovel in the ground. Uh, again, Stacy highlighted, you know, sometimes it's as simple as we just want to put up a, an informational sign. Um, but we do have to be that careful. Uh, we do have to be that conscious because there are plenty of places in state parks where either we haven't surveyed or what may or may not be there is just not exceedingly obvious. So um, again, these are this is the sort of the, the where we are now and how we're trying to move forward and you know really encourage people uh, to to invest in the appropriate treatment of the historic resources. Um, this is a project that took place um, just before I started with uh, DNR. Uh, this is the uh, picnic shelter at Orchard Beach. Uh, at the top on the left there, you can see where the, the pavilion was, it's right here. Uh, and you can see how eroded this beach was. Originally, this was 45 or 50 feet from the bluff when it was constructed. So that's how far back Lake Michigan has, has you know, inched. Um, during this high water, it was dropping and dropping and dropping. And, and so in, on the right-hand picture, you can actually see the fence and you can see the position where uh, the pavilion was and the unit, the, the division determined that the only thing that we could really do was to move that. There wasn't any way we could shore up that shoreline or that we really wanted to try to shore up the shoreline. Um, so uh, you can see that we took the pavilion, which was in the midst of the campground area, uh, and we slid it down or 
in this case up in the image is north to the day use portion of Orchard Beach where it now sits. It's obviously still available to the folks that are in the campground, but it's especially available to uh, the day use folks, which is really who was it, it was targeted at the beginning. Um, we very carefully planned this move route. We minimized the number of trees uh, and there were some trees that had to come out. We, they, we did investigate above ground and below ground before the move. Uh, and you can see uh, in the lower left here, this is the building on site, but they have not taken the cribbing out yet. Uh, fantastically successful project, um, really has gotten the attention of people uh, and only proves that, you know, with the appropriate commitment and planning, we can do the things that we need to do to maintain and preserve our park system. Uh, we have to give a lot of credit and, and recognition to uh, our chief, uh, Ron Olson, who very quickly got behind this idea uh, and recognized the significance of it. So um, really wonderful project. Uh, we hope not to have to do this too many more times, but um, we're, we learn from it. And I think that we're prepared to do it again if you know, need be. Um, right now, one of the biggest things that we have going on is um, some work at Hartwick Pines. Um, uh, getting roofs on buildings, even if we're not sure how we're going to use them, is a, is a hugely important thing, in my opinion. Uh, it hasn't always been a priority, so we've been pushing really hard to make sure that we get weatherproof, weather resistant, I won't say proof, envelopes. Um, we are working right now to seal up uh, the Memorial Building, which is the original visitor center at Hartwick Pine. Um, we have a chimney and roof project that's going on right now. Uh, we are also in the process of doing assessment and getting uh, documents to do the exterior log repair uh, on the building and potentially uh, some new use studies uh, to see how we might be able to effectively use the building and hopefully get the public back into it. Um, one of the things that our system happens to have is some really great photographs. And through these photographs, we have discovered that some of this furniture that you see, like this wonderful log table, uh, we actually still have. It's in the visitor center at Hartwick Pines, and we would love to see if uh, we can come up with an appropriate use and, and return it to the space. Uh, and the other thing that we are always out there looking for is in this image, you see the original chandelier that hung in the space. Um, we know that it's not in our possession anymore. Um, but as we work on some of these things, it's, it's a way to try to see if there's an opportunity to recreate that kind of detail and get it back into uh, one of these spaces. So um, then the other thing that, that I'm responsible for is trying to communicate information to uh, our, our planning staff, our park unit supervisors, um, you know, and what's the appropriate way to treat these things. So um, whether it's an NPS document, whether it's material from the MHPN, or whether it's material from the National Trust, um, trying to connect people with the resources they need uh, is one of my primary responsibilities. Um, the other thing that I encourage because of the kind of work that we're doing uh, is that folks use the preservation brief series and particularly the preservation tech notes. Uh, again, these are really wonderful, quite technical documentation, but um, you know, I'm here to help the park folks go through them and understand the content uh, and hopefully move projects forward uh, in, the, in an appropriate fashion. So, um, rec passport is kind of the best part of my new job. Um, when you do your rec passport, uh, you are supporting the park service, park system in general. Uh, the proceeds from that go directly to the park service system, but you're also supporting the cultural resources in our park system. Uh, we get a three percent, three and a half percent of the annual revenue that comes from the rec passport sales specifically to do work on cultural resources in our park system. So 
um, you know, you, you, you do support all the other things, but you also are supporting um, the, the parks and their historic buildings. Um, right now, uh, we are taking or we're putting together our 2023 budget, uh, which is kind of exciting. It's the first time I get to do it from beginning to end. Um, and we are right now asking for ideas from um, the parks themselves, the planners themselves, uh, and then other things that throughout the course of the year that we've picked up, uh, and then we will be uh, able to spend about uh, $340,000 on cultural resource specific projects. They can be as simple as uh, resurfacing the historic tennis courts at, at Bawabic State Park, which is up in the UP, uh, to helping to do uh, plans and specifications for the rehabilitation of uh, a building uh, right now we're looking at the Ralston cabin that we saw earlier. So I thank you for your time and I appreciate uh, your commitment to historic resources in the state uh, and we'd be happy to answer questions now if we can. Great. Rob and Stacy, thank you so much for your kind uh, time spent today. We've got quite a few questions in line, and so I'm just going to go to them and start reading them off. First, we'd like to um, start with uh, an anonymous attendee. As artifacts are found on park lands, is the DNR warehousing the items themselves, displaying items in their own facilities, or working with the Michigan History Center to accession, store, and display them at museum facilities? <laughs> All of the above. The Michigan, the, the Michigan History Center is part of the Department of Natural Resources, so they are very much um, uh, a part, and I would argue, potentially at the heart and soul, of, of, of any kind of history work in the DNR. So we, um, we store them in the Michigan History Center. We share responsibilities for collections uh, with the State Historic Preservation Office, who has a history of managing the state archaeological collections, and we keep everything together with archaeological artifacts at the state and with the data that we all create, whether it's from the DNR, from our Department of Transportation, through our SHPO, we all put that in one place. It's like the movie Highlander. There can be only one, one collection, one data set, and that's how we keep everything organized. All right, thank you. Next question from another anonymous attendee. There was a time when the DNR was not aware of the trove of cultural resources they had on their lands, but not so now. What caused the shift in DNR's thinking and when did that happen? Either I don't know that there was ever a time when they weren't aware of it. I think that it's more realistic to say there wasn't really a system in place to deal with it. Um, a lot of credit for the stewardship unit and the work that we do has to go to Ray Falzer, who uh, is uh, an environmental biologist who came to the system early, um, 23, 24 years ago, uh, and really started the champion, started to champion stewardship, um, both uh, flora, fauna, so ecological uh, and cultural. Um, and it's just, it's been a slow evolution ever since. Mm -hmm. and, and Mark Hoffman and Sandra Clark uh, with DNR uh, leadership have been for years aware of this need and have advocated for staff and other resources to uh, recognize that not only do we have a natural resources obligation, but a cultural resources obligation. I, I think it's also imperative that people understand that it's not just, uh, you know, camping sites out in the woods that are part of what is the the net or the, the state park uh, network and, and really those resources are, are much deeper than what you see when you're camping in the woods out in wherever. So, mm -hmm. yes, and the, and the public really needs to know about that. So. Thank you. Uh, another anonymous attendee uh, says, I watched a great walking tour you had produced uh, for the Michigan Historic Preservation Network's virtual fall benefit in 2020. You walked us through the woods 
to the Sanilac I'm sorry, petroglyphs, showed us some small people gifts hidden in the woods, talked with guests at the site itself, and showed us close-ups of the rock carvings. <laughs> is that available to watch anywhere? Say, is it on a YouTube that the state right. This was a fall webinar we did for MHPN. Oh, uh, COVID has my timeline off. I don't know how many years ago, it was maybe two, uh, uh, maybe three, but um, we have not shared that video publicly, but um, if you email me, um, we can talk about getting you the content of it. All right. And for those of you who aren't paying attention, MHPN is the Michigan Historic Preservation Network. We are the people who are bringing you this webinar today. Christine Stevenson writes in and asks, um, what has the LIDAR and photogrammetry at Sanilac taught you about the petro <laughs> petroglyphs and how did you do that? <laughs> Excellent question, Christine Stevenson. It's um, a week. <laughs> uh, long story short, we're just learning. We're gonna repeat this digital documentation with our MDOT partners every five years. And to our knowledge, this is the first longitudinal study in this respect of rock art anywhere in the world. So we are gonna learn things about the, the, the change in carvings over time. Are they getting worn away? Are they changing? But we're also, so we'll get baseline preservation data that we can track over time, but we will also get a master map of all the carvings that are present. So if into the future, you know, a thousand years from now, is this site gonna exist? We cannot be sure. So digital documentation is something that the tribe has advocated for for years. And now we're making that um, you know, come alive. So uh, stick with us. We'll have more results on what it all means and what it's teaching us after we do another round, um, which is slated for next summer. Outstanding. I would also, I would yes, also throw in there what has it taught us. Uh, I think that this is the first time that it really gave a lot of people in the department pause and an understanding of the value of some of the, the higher tech tools um, that we don't have currently, um, but have moved it up on the list of, yeah, those are things we probably should have within our own system. So uh, it's been a very wonderful opportunity to learn from the site, but also to educate people in the department. Is that and, the and kind of thing? Well. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say we work great with other state agencies, whether it's MDOT or Eagle or others. So if there's tech toys in one agency, you know, we can usually find a way to collaborate and work together so that these tools that are purchased with state money or public money um, can be shared as widely as possible. So, you know, just an amazing network of partners beyond the DNR. There's quite a few people on the call or on the Zoom right now, and it seems to me it might be an opportunity to um, address something uh, that you just mentioned, Robert, was um, is can the public advocate for the state park system? I mean, they should be able to contact their uh, elected <laughs> representatives and say, hey, we want more of the, the high tech things that let us know in better ways what we have. Is that something that uh, that people on this call could do? We need more technical equipment to do X, Y, and Z. Sure, staff. And I, I'm putting you on the spot because I know you're not really allowed to say that. But I, I would I would speak for you and say, if you're interested, dear listeners, you should contact <laughs> your elected officials and say, we support more technical equipment for the state parks. So while, while we are not allowed to stump for certain causes, we are able to educate. So if we are contacted by legislators, we are happy to educate them about the resources that we have and uh, the, the needs that are out there. That's, that Very is part good. of our job to answer those questions. The Very other good. thing that I will I will throw out there is um, we're almost always working on a general management plan, which, which is the guiding document for our parks throughout the system. Say that again, um, the general general management plans. Okay, um, I'm working on five right now. Um, whenever, wherever uh, you are, and when you hear about a general management plan, and that's either one of your favorite parks or in your area. Uh, participate, you know. Um, we actually do want to hear what the public has to say. 
Um, there are some well-organized and vocal specialty user groups that do a wonderful job of getting their voice out there, um, which is great, you know, more power to them. But sometimes the less well-organized groups don't get that same voice. Uh, so I would encourage you to participate in the system. Here's an interesting next question, which is actually, that was a great survey, uh, segue. Um, Christopher Warner asks, uh, are there plans to provide public access to the ArcGIS database of digitized artifacts, LIDAR, photometric, and otherwise? From, from the Sanilac Park? We are working on that. Um, I, I believe the question relates to the, you know, the LIDAR and the artifacts from the Petroglyph Park, if that's true. We are making sure that the decisions we make about the sharing of cultural information, artifacts and images of the site, because it's a sacred site to Great Lakes and Anishinaabek, are done in a very deliberate and tribal web way. So yes, we are working on public facing uh, web platforms that will share um, that information to the, group, to the degree that's considered appropriate by tribal leadership. Very good. And uh, a subsequent question from the same viewer. Can local histori historical museums, uh, museum organizations liaison with the DNR to obtain historical information about indigenous cultures in their area? We are happy to uh, answer questions as we can. We can also link you directly to tribal preservation offices um, that um, uh, speak for themselves and can provide you the, the, the very finest information that, that's available. And there may also be uh, information available at the state uh, with your friends at the State Historic Preservation Office. All right, and one last one from the same viewer. Uh, describe how the DNR Archaeology Department interacts with the historical survey work done by MDOT prior or during roadway construction. Sure, MDOT staffs their own archaeology team. Um, which is fantastic. This is a decision they made over just over, I think, a decade ago. And uh, it was a great one in my mind. So they have archaeologists who do trunk line projects, archaeology projects for MDOT, you know, um, MDOT roads and roads that MDOT uh, are in charge of. And all the archaeology they do, all the collections and all that data um, are all housed together with the DNR's collections and data any other agencies, collections, and data, and all of that is in the State Archaeological Collections, which is housed in the Michigan History Center, and in the State Archaeological Site File that is housed in the Preservation Office. Very good. Uh, an anonymous attendee says uh, that they're beginning to see that um, there's far too much for just you and Rob to be covering, but are there other staff considered? Either one of you. Are there other staff considered? Is there is there more that we could do? Sure, absolutely. There's more that we could do. Um, I I would be it would be disingenuous of me to suggest that either Stacy or I wouldn't love some help. Okay. Um, are there other staff considered? Yes, we're trying to have those discussions and make those considerations. Um, it it's a long and complicated process. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to say, yeah, we need more help. It's always difficult to find a way to get the FTEs and get the funding on an annual basis. Uh, we are looking at some other ways, potentially, uh, to get Stacy particularly some help. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's, it relies on us as staff uh, and our folks upline to, to be sort of creative with some of the funding in the meantime. So we'll get there. A, I promise and, we'll get there. And I'm, I'm an optimist. Point. I'm sorry. I, I'm an optimist and we have a vision. And I truly believe that Rob and I are, uh, and working with Wayne and others, we are the beginning of what is going to become a larger program. We do have a ways to go, but um, uh, I, I believe that it will grow and um, be a parallel on par with um, other states uh, DNR culture resources programs eventually. So uh, everyone can help us all get there. Thanks. The uh, subsequent question uh, from an anonymous attendee that I'm going to kind of mitigate a little bit, but um, in previous administrations, there had been defundings of arts and culture organizations and that work. 
Um, how do you feel about the current administration? And is it, I guess the, the begged question might be, could they be petitioned by the public that we think this is really important work that the DNR is doing and, and the departments within the DNR? And um, do you think that current administration might be sympathetic to those types of calls? Abs I mean, absolutely. You're always welcome to reach out to your representatives or, or the governor. You know, preservation and archaeology has been a bipartisan support issue through the years. If, if you're familiar with the recent passage of the tax credit, that was championed by Wayne Schmidt, Republican, right? So um, we, we, have, we're, we're, we have a love fest in preservation and archaeology with Republicans, Democrats across the board. So uh, don't wait till a certain person gets in office. Do it all the time. Do it early. Do it again and again. <laughs> Do it early and often. Yeah. All right. Uh, Janet Krieger with the Michigan Historic Preservation Network, longtime preservationist, asks, how far along is the DNR with its survey and inventory of what cultural resources are on its property? And does its data system interface with the database of the State Historic Preservation Office? The data does interface. Everything we identify and make um, eligibility recommendations on go right into the master data set at the preservation office so that it can be used by all researchers um, for land management, section 106 reviews, you name it. Um, we are just beginning. Uh, we, we are very far down the road with inventorying above ground resources on, on state lands, uh, especially park and recreation lands. Rob can talk about that. But with archaeology, we, we've done the most archaeology we've done, I would say, have been in our state parks and recreation areas. We are much further off from baseline inventories on our forest, wildlife, and other lands. Long way to go. All right. In, in, in terms of resources in uh, the actual state park system, the things that are listed on the National Register, um, obviously, the SHPO has in their system. Um, the things that have been formally determined eligible the SHPO has in their system. Uh, in terms of the uh, historic resources, uh, historic structures and, and resources report, um, that includes all of those things that are listed, but then it includes a whole subset of things that probably are not National Register eligible at all. Um, but as a system, we have determined are historically significant and need to be preserved. Um, where are we with the state parks? We're, we're well into the state parks. The things that we are missing now are uh, linear parks, so, so the trails. Um, again, a lot of those are railroad corridors. Uh, so those have the potential to have a, a fair number of resources. Um, the state harbors, uh, where a state harbor is also in a state park, we have good records where a state harbor is a independent being, we don't necessarily have uh, a really great survey there yet, um, nor things like um, voting access sites. Um, we know that we have resources on voting access sites, um, but it would be disingenuous of me to say we have our arms around that yet. All righty, thank you. Uh, an anonymous attendee questions um, or asks, Indigenous population involvement in DNR activities is clear from your remarks today. Are there any DNR sites that are picking up on other underrepresented communities? In other words, African-American involvement in logging, women's involvement in early settlement areas, and et cetera. Um, yes, and that is increasing. Um, uh, for example, um, there was a single female pioneer homesteader um, whose uh, homestead is uh, one of the many archaeological sites within the 240 acres in Samalak Park. And that is something we didn't interpret in the past, but are looking at interpreting in the future because she has such a unique story. But, um, you know, uh, the stories in our parks are changing. We are a long way from where we began when we started interpreting parks a half a century ago, just like our historic marker, state historic marker program has come a long way over the years, right? Um, so I think you're going to be saying um, uh, there are some of that, absolutely, but does there need to be a whole lot more? Absolutely. So uh, yeah, yeah, um, hopefully, you know, we will get there sooner right. rather than later. Very good. Rebecca Savage asks, what's the DNR's role 
in the Ulysses S or the Ulysses Grant House restoration. Uh, I believe you had a photo in your in your uh, stack, Rob. The DNR's role um, is primarily been through the historical center. Um, that property was on the uh, state fairground site, and it's been. Stacy, correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the answer is gifted to the Detroit public school system. Um, I will cautiously concur with that. I, I I'm think, not sure of the details. Um, but, and then it has been moved to uh, another site. So this is, I wanna say it's third home. Uh, it's, it's a well-traveled building. Um, but beyond that, the DNR is not directly involved uh, or will not be directly involved that as far as I know, with the operation of that facility. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, and an anonymous attendee says, is there any interest sh being shown in the Gwen Frostick studio in Benzonia as a state park? I hear things when I'm up north and it would be great. Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think there was some um, initial, um, uh, 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 dreaming and scheming done, at least by some of us. My first reaction when it went up for sale was, ah, can we get it? Because <laughs> I go there a couple times a year and it's just, there's there's just no place like it. And the story of Gwen Frostick and her environmental um, uh, justice uh, history, her poetry, her art, her woodblocks, everything. She's just such a, a, a unique uh, and strong um, art uh, environmental character in Michigan history. Um, to my knowledge, the DNR is not going to pick up that property, but I have heard, and I've been, I've been watching out, that, that there is another group in line for that. But um, yeah, boy, whoever asked that really hit something on my wish list. Yeah. All right. And another question from Janet Krieger. A previous question makes us extend to you an open invitation to perform your LIDAR and photogrammetry presentation again at the Michigan Historic Preservation Network Statewide Preservation Conference. As you know, the 2023 program is zippered up for Mackinac Island in May, but in 2024, we will be in Kalamazoo. And of course, we haven't uh, issued our uh, request for programming, but that is open and we would love to have you. Oh. It accepted, absolutely. I will work with our uh, MDOT buddies and our tribal buddies, and we will be there. Thank you. All righty. And the last Twister one, on. today, go ahead. I'm sorry. Tw twist around. Get to talk about it again. <laughs> <laughs> last question today is, when will you get to look at the Charles Mears barn within the Mears State Park in Pentwater? That is an excellent question, Steve Steyer. I give that to Rob. <laughs> <laughs> that was an anonymous, by the way. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, when will we get to look at the Mears Barn? Um, I've already looked at the Mears Barn. Um, just for clarity's sake, it is not part of the state park in Pentwater. It is part of the state game area in Pentwater. It is their property, not ours. Um, I have been working with wildlife on that particular property. Um, we are looking at what we hope is some possible ways to uh, get that building preserved and potentially uh, into the hands of some groups that have a longer term vision for it than we do. Um, it's a great barn, uh, but it's not something that wildlife is in a position to uh, operate in a way that would invite the public into it. So, a whole nother webinar could be, be could be a uh, hard choices, hard choices we have to make yeah. as resource managers. I see, um, Rob. I want to thank you for your pitch um, that you included for the MHPN resource guide. That was great. Thank you. I use it um, all the time. Everybody should. <laughs> you're right. It's a very good resource. Go to mhpn.com/resources. There's another pitch. Stacy, Robert, thank you so much for your time today. Listeners, please thank you. Uh, we really appreciate your questions. It was a great batch today. Um, 
This concludes our presentation on archaeology and architecture. Um, and our, as you notice, our present presenters today have been Robert McKay and Stacy Chorzynski. Next month's webinar is as yet to be determined. So stay tuned and we will find out what that is. Thank you for listening. I appreciate all of your time and thank you very much to you presenters. Have a great day and we'll see you next month.